Good morning, members and friends of Trinity Lutheran Church. I welcome you and greet you. Whether you're tuning in from near at hand or far away, it's always a blessing to have you with us. This is the sixth Sunday of Easter, the Easter season, and in two weeks will be the, the day of Pentecost, which we'll talk a little bit about this morning later on. But I want to offer a few announcements, and the first two are rather sad. First of all, some of you woke up to the news this morning of the, the bombing in Afghanistan where 50 schoolgirls were, were slain in that insane war between the Shiites and the Sunni Muslims, something that, that we can't understand, but that breaks our hearts and breaks the hearts of God, their creator, as well. And then a lot more close to home. We just uh, received the sad news that a very m prominent member of this community, Stevens Point, he's not a member of our church here, but he's so well known in town, Cliff King, was lost his life in a car accident yesterday. And so this morning we will keep the King family and all of those families in Afghanistan in our prayers. I want to remind you that we have an opportunity to send in other prayer requests. Please do so during the course of the service and we'll keep track of them as they come in and we'll include them in our prayers this morning. And finally, I want to say a profound word of, of gratitude for all the mothers in our lives. It's Mother's Day and we want to say Happy Mother's Day to everyone. Not everyone is a mother, but everyone has had a mother. So we're all involved in this and so Happy Mother's Day to all of us. I especially want to say that I'm thinking this morning of those wonderful women all through our lives who give so much. Not every woman, of course, gets to have children of her own, but even those women are people who go out and find children to share their love with, sometimes as a school teacher, sometimes just the love that they shower upon their nieces and nephews. So we remember all of them this morning on Mother's Day and know that the sacrificial love of God has never been more visually enacted for us as an example than through the hearts of the women in our lives. So God bless you all and, and thanks to all the moms. We begin with our opening song, All Are Welcome. Children. 
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you have prepared for those who love you joys beyond understanding. Pour into our hearts such love for you that loving you above all things, we may, not, we may obtain your promises which exceed all we can desire. Through Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit, just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. to God. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 98. Our choir has had the pleasure of getting together to produce a recording of it for us.
reading from 1 John. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome, for whatever is born of God conquers the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. Who is it that conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with the water only, but with the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one that testifies, for the Spirit is the truth. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. The Holy Gospel today is taken from the 15th chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because I have made known everything to you that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. I'm giving you these commandments, that you love one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Christ. Good morning, Trinity children of God. It's been a busy week at my house. About two weeks ago now, we adopted a rescue dog. She's eight months old, and we have been spending our time learning all about her. And she has been spending her time exploring, sleeping, barking, and learning all about us. We can learn a lot about someone just by spending time with them, by watching what they say, what they do, and how they do it, and how they treat others. Today, in one of our Bible readings, Jesus is giving his disciples some instructions for their lives together. He says these very important words. Love one another as I have loved you. What does that mean to love like Jesus? And isn't that going to be kind of hard? The disciples that day knew what Jesus meant, though. And they also knew that sometimes it was going to be a challenge. They knew how to love like Jesus because they had seen Jesus show that unconditional love to others all the time. They saw how Jesus looked out for and cared for them. They listened as Jesus shared about God and God's love with them and everyone he met. They saw how Jesus showed compassion and understanding and love to those in the world who others didn't always notice. Because Jesus loved the disciples first, and they had seen that, they knew how to love. Now you and I didn't get to travel from town to town and share those same experiences with Jesus. But we have so many wonderful stories in the Bible that show us how Jesus lived and tell us all about Jesus' love. Because of those amazing examples and the love that the disciples continue to show, as his followers today, you and I also know what Jesus meant by those words. And we can do our very best every day to love others like that. It won't always be easy, but it's
and what Jesus wants us to share with the world. When we show kindness, when we share and give of ourselves, when we pray for others and help whoever we can, through our example, we will show even more people how they can love like Jesus too. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we are so thankful for your love. Help us to go and share and do everything we can to always love like you do. Amen. Um, thanks so much for listening, everyone. Go and share some of that love this week, and I'll see you again soon. Thank you, Todd, for that special message. And there was one Good announcement. Morning. There was one announcement that I wanted to add, and I had forgotten to say it. Um, just this morning, in, in honor of Mother's Day, um, I would like to say to all of the mothers that happen to be tuning in this morning, just this once, I'd like to give you permission to attend worship in your pajamas. <laughs> and now, dear friends, grace and peace to you from God, our Heavenly Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The corniest name that I have ever heard <laughs> is the name Cornelius. Of course, it comes from the Bible. The Bible actually has a lot of corny names. Can you imagine the teasing your daughter would have had in high school or grade school if you would have dared to name her by the biblical name Dorcas? A lot of strange names. This one, Cornelius, comes from the story in the book of Acts. We didn't hear his name today because this story was begun in our readings a couple of weeks ago, but we're finishing it up. Paul had, or Peter had been called to the household of Cornelius to explain the gospel to him. I've never met a man who actually went by Cornelius. I've known some with that name. One went by the name Corky. One went by the name Neil. But maybe in the world of Roman soldiers, Cornelius was a distinguished and honorable name because Cornelius in our story was a centurion. Now, centurions were very important members of the officer, uh, officer corps in the Roman army. They would have been in charge of a great number of men they would have meted out discipline and handed out marching and fighting orders. They would have expected everyone to stand beside them and fight to the death if necessary. They would be the ones who were most admired and feared in the community. And of course, because he was a Roman centurion, that meant that he was a Gentile, he was a non-Jew. And it is to his home that Peter has been called because as it turns out, this centurion, this important and feared man, loved God and wanted to know more about the story of Jesus. So he sent for Peter, and Peter came with some of his followers. We heard earlier when we read the beginning of this story a couple of weeks ago, we word, heard how he feared God and was inquisitive about the Christian faith, which is why he sent for Peter. So today we hear the rest of the story, and people were surprised, the Jewish people that went with Peter were surprised at how this story turned out, that God would bless even Gentiles, they thought that they were going to have this new faith all to themselves as Jewish converts to Christianity. But no, apparently God had something else in mind. Now, the story of Pentecost, which we will read in a couple of weeks, that story tells that the Holy Spirit came to the church like a freight train and it, it came into, this, into the occupants of this private home sounding like a tornado. It ignited them with flames upon their head. It drove them out as if by a great fierce wind into the street. And there they were speaking in tongues and acting like madmen. And some people thought they had been drinking already in the morning. It was a big event. It was the birth of the church. And there were many thousands of people that came to believe in Jesus just in that moment. The Pentecost story of the church. This story, however, is a mini Pentecost the disciples were getting used to this idea of the Pentecost by now, by the time we get to the story in the Bible, in the book of Acts. So they were used to some of these gifts that they received, speaking in tongues and healing in Jesus' name and prophesying and all of those things. And of course, they were all good Jewish followers of Jesus. They felt blessed that God would favor them with the capacity to heal in Jesus' name. So they followed Peter to this house to see what would happen as he spoke to this Gentile man. They went to the home of Cornelius. And the whole thing begins once again with Peter preaching as he did on the day of Pentecost. And this time it resulted in numerous people in the household of Cornelius being overcome by the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues just like the gift, the very gift that had been given to the Jewish followers of Jesus. Again, with Peter's preaching and the result of all these people being given the Holy Spirit, it was rather astonishing. 
But Peter was pretty quick to catch on. Some of the other Jews there perhaps were not. Well, once he sees what's happening, he concludes, since God seems to have made up his mind about these people, we might as well do the obvious thing. We might as well baptize them right now. And they sent for some water to bring them fully into the fold of faith. And just like that, God opened the door of the church to Gentiles, to non-Jewish believers. Cornelius was given a new name, the name Child of God, Friend of Jesus. Just like that, God opened the doors to a new idea and sent the church in a new direction. Just like that, God shed his light upon the Gentiles. Just like that, God opened the door of the church even to the Romans. And that has been the way it is ever since. God keeps opening those doors. What this story reveals to us as it did to them is that God is always full of surprises. God is ready to break in whenever and wherever God chooses. God can rip open the doors of our understanding and the doors of our expectations and do a brand new thing. And God can do it completely without our permission. Of course, many of us don't like that idea that God can do these new things so quickly. Because we spend a lifetime in our faith learning how to play by the rules, learning how to play various roles in church. We build our churches and our congregations with missions and plans and constitutions and budgets and bylaws and, and committees and councils. We hire pastors and staff. We structure our ministry the way it's always been structured in our denomination. We do it the right way. We hold our services in the usual way. We expect the usual people to show up and we expect the usual words to be said, the usual fellowship to follow. That's what we like, that's what we know. That's what we want to cling to. <laughs> but sometimes I think that God must just smile and say, oh yeah, just watch this. And just like that, in 1517, the Reformation happened. And just like that, in 1738, John Wesley attended a Bible study at a, a place called Aldersgate. And just like that, the Methodist movement began where they started to hold services outdoors, which was unheard of. And, and Charles Wesley began to write contemporary music, songs to sing in the outdoor revival meetings. And just like that, in 1906, the Holy Spirit showed up at the Azusa Street Baptist Church and the revival started that began the Pentecostal church. And just like that, people began speaking in tongues and doing miracles. Just like that, the Pentecostal church was born. This happened just over 100 years ago, and you can imagine all of the Lutherans and Episcopalians and Catholics and Baptists and Presbyterians just watching on in wide-eyed wonder at all of the mighty things that God was doing anew as if it were the day of Pentecost. It all started, all of this started that one day back in Cornelius' house with him and his household, with God doing a new and wonderful thing and when you see these things happen, you just have to scratch your head and say, wow, it, it looks like God wants to do that now. And a new thing happens. So the question is, what's next? What in the world could be next? With mainline churches all over America declining, with complete uncertainty about what's going to happen after the pandemic, with people now able to attend worship broadcasts alive, from the other side of the globe? What in the world could be next? What does God have in mind for us as Lutheran churches get fewer and fewer? What does God have in mind as America becomes less and less a nation known as a Christian nation? What does God have in mind now that cathedrals all over Europe are standing empty as museums? Well, we just don't know what will be next. But we know one thing for certain. We know that along the way, Jesus took Peter aside and said to him, Peter, you are my rock. And on this rock, I will build the foundations of my church and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. Peter was laying the bricks of the church and its foundation at Cornelius' house. And he and the disciples continued to do that as long as they had breath in them wherever they went, laying the foundation of the Christian church that we know today. It's hard for us to imagine what will come next, but we know that the Holy Spirit 
will still be leading us as the Spirit did them. And I have to tell you, God is already planning something new. We don't know what it will be. Something that would be unimagined by us ordinary people, us, us ordinary churchgoers. But if nothing can prevail against the church of God, then we just have to wonder, what will the church look like in 20 years? What will it look like in 100 years? It will be something that we might not recognize, but it will still be something that nothing can prevail against because God wants to build his church in the world and nothing can come against it. It may look different than we know it. It might, it might involve different functions than we are used to in our denominational system. It may have strange new music, and it may have some people, perhaps people unlike us, maybe even people that we don't really approve of. That'll be up to God. But God will always find a way to sustain God's church filled with people around the globe who, will be, who might have names that sound funny to us, but who will be given new names, the name of child of God, friend of Jesus. And there are only two things about this new church that we can know for certain. It will involve people that won't be made up of robots, <laughs> still ordinary people, a lot of them Gentiles like you and me and Cornelius. And it will also proclaim the gospel love of Jesus Christ, the same gospel love that was proclaimed by Peter in Cornelius' house, the same proclamation of the good news that was shared by Martin Luther in the Reformation and John and Charles Wesley through their songs and hymns during the Methodist movement, the same good news shared by Pastor William Seymour in the Azusa Street Revival, the same good news shared by the Reverend Billy Graham in all of his international crusades for Christ, the same good news that was preached this morning across the street at St. Stephen's Church or preached down the street at the Baptist Church or around the corner at the Presbyterian Church, the same good news that is preached today and every Sunday, even here at Trinity Lutheran Church. The Church of Christ will always have that to anchor it, and that will never change. So. Are you ready for the new thing that God intends to do with the church? Well, let's pray that we are. And let's pray that we will be a part of it, no matter where it takes us. For that, let's pray right now. Surprising God, prepare our hearts for the moving of your spirit and give us the courage to follow wherever you choose to lead us. Help us to embrace the people and and the ways that you embrace. We pray in the name of him who remains the same through all generations, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
as a sign that Christ is always the same, we recite what they've always recited, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father of Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Alive in the risen Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring our prayers before God, who promises to hear us and answer in steadfast love. Loving God, you call us to be your fruit-bearing church. Strengthen the bonds among all Christian churches. Let us live into the unity that Jesus declared was his hope and intention for all who follow him. Hear us, O oh God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is, is great. great. Creating God, all the earth praises you. The seas roar and the hills sing for joy. Fill the earth with your life so that by their song, all creatures of land and sea and sky, burrowing and soaring, may call us to join them in praise. Hear us, O oh God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is great. great. Faithful Savior, you conquered the world not with weapons, but with undying love. Plant your word in the hearts of the nation's leaders and give them your spirit so that the peoples of the world may live in peace. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Caring healer, you forget no one and accompany the lonely. Be present with those who are sick or suffering. Provide for those needing homes or medical care and point us towards life-changing responses to these needs in our own communities. Today we pray for our friends in need of your healing comfort. Dave, Dale, Lori, Kent, Oz, Keith, Dan, Patty. We also pray for the family of Cliff King as they mourn his, his death yesterday. And bring peace to the country of Afghanistan as we mourn the lives of the 50 girls killed in the bombing there this week. We also pray for Dolores, Deb Shuda's mother. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Gracious God, as a mother comforts her child, you comfort us. Bless mothers and mothering people in our lives. Comfort those who miss their mothers, mothers who grieve, those who grieve because they cannot be mothers, and those who have never known a loving mother. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. In the hope of new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And now we pray the, Lord, the Lord's Prayer, which our Father taught us. Our Father, who, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
And now please receive this benediction. Thanks be to God.